gripping journey where you get to examine the evidence that put two people on death row. A bizarre development in the stabbing deaths of two young boys. Officials have now charged their mother with the murders. I didn't murder my children. 19 year old Julius Darius Jones. The primary charge, murder in the first. Killed a totally innocent person. So it was a crime that richly deserves the death penalty. That's from The Last Defense, a new ABC docu-series that premieres tomorrow night. It tells the story of two people on death row and all the twists and turns their cases have taken. Earlier today, RFL's senior political producer, Karen McBride, spoke with two of the show's executive producers, Vanessa Potkin and Ada Lazenring. Vanessa, let's start with Darlie Routier. She's been on death row now in Texas for 20 years, sentenced for the murder of her two young sons. Why does her story need to be told now? Well, um, it needs to be told because she's been on death row for over two decades. And, you know, there's a narrative that's out there um, that was used to obtain her conviction. Um, and there's a completely other side of the story. You know, when you watch The Last Defense, which starts tomorrow night, you know, you start to see that uh, the state built a case basically on nothing. Um, at the heart of her case is faulty forensic evidence, blood patterns, uh, analysis, which, um, you know, we know to be erroneous. Um, very high error rates have been documented. Uh, and uh, faulty forensics in general has played a role in about half of the DNA exonerations. Uh, you know, this series in general is so critical because the National Institute of Justice put out a study a couple years back, and it's been documented that over, you know, 4% of people on death row are likely to be innocent. That is a very alarming number. That means over 100 people today are in prison on death row ultimately facing execution for a crime they did not commit. And do you think there was a rush to public judgment here? And maybe talk about how the media might have played a part in that. I remember the, the video that, that you've noted about um, Darlie when she was celebrating her son's birthday, how that might have contributed to this. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you had, a, you know, a, a horrible crime, right? Two young kids are, have been murdered. And, um, you know, the it was a very, you know, small police department. They had to call in an investigator from a neighboring department. And the lead investigator who comes onto the scene within 20 minutes had decided, had reached the conclusion, more or less, that Darlie had, you know, staged this crime scene, had stabbed herself, and had, had murdered her children. And so at that point, you know, there, it wasn't an investigation any longer into the truth. It was about building a case against Darlie. And so, um, you know, uh, police and prosecutors videotaped a ceremony. There was, a, you know, a funeral um, that Darlie and the family had for the boys. One of the boys' birthday, you know, was just, you know, a, a week, but, you know, after he was murdered. And so they ended up, um, you know, carrying out, a, you know, after the funeral, a, a birthday celebration and trying to honor him. And, um, you know, the, the prosecution just showed a very small part of that entire day, you know, long um, event. And this, you know, one part where Darlie's, you know, spraying silly string and, you know, doing other things that were planned for, the, for her son's birthday. And so, you know, the jurors didn't see the up and down. And that tape was very significant in, in obtaining her conviction. The jury watched it multiple times and you know if you just see that one part of you know a mother smiling and um, spraying silly string it's very hard to overcome that you think oh my god uh, you know she had to have done it but that is not the full story and what you'll see with the last defense is more of the tape the fuller story well, let's pivot now to uh, Julius Jones. He, too, has maintained his innocence in the carjacking death of an Oklahoma man. Why did you select his case to examine? Julius Jones had a racially charged trial in a state that has issues with that. Um, and he was convicted predominantly on informant testimony, which is which is snitch testimony. And that is actually the leading cause of wrongful convictions in death penalty cases. In addition to that, he actually didn't fit the description of the perpetrator. In fact, the co-defendant, um, Mr. Jordan, did fit that description, but he cut a deal with the state in which he not only saved himself of being on death row, he was sentenced to 30 years and released after only 15, which is unheard of in a homicide.
and he's appealed his case several times. Given both of your experience with criminal defense and all that you've seen, what are your hopes that he'll be vindicated? Well, I don't know if we can say that we're confident. You know, our system gets it wrong at pretty alarming rates. Um, and, you know, we'll never know the extent of how many people we wrongfully convict in this country. You know, it, through DNA evidence, um, about 160 people have been proven innocent. When you take into account all the types of evidence, about 2,200 people have been exonerated after being wrongfully convicted. But we have the world's largest prison population. We have over 2.3 million people in prison. And if you, you know, thought of a very, very conservative error rate and said, what if 1% of those people were innocent, you know, you'd have over 23,000 people in prison today who are innocent. And so we can't have the volume that we do in, right now in our system and get it right. It's just, you know, it's impossible. Most people don't even go to trial. They end up pleading guilty because the system is not set up for the volume that we have and for people to really exercise their constitutional rights and have adequate defense counsel and, um, you know, what you're really entitled to under our Constitution as a person accused of a crime. Now, to that point, I noticed that uh, both of you had penned a piece in the New York Times about Kevin Cooper, another inmate who maintains his innocence. And you talk about what happens after a verdict, saying that the burden shifts to the convicted to prove innocence from the cell. You have to be the voice of these people. Is, is that what the last defense is hoping to convey? It is, and um, it, it really is an uphill battle, and I think it deserves national attention because at the end of the day, many people in the nation are going to be called to serve as jurors, and there is no greater responsibility than serving on not just any jury, but on a, a capital case because you're actually determining not just guilt or innocence, but potentially whether or not that person will be executed. And I think it's important for people to know that an expert can walk into a trial, in, into a trial, sit on the stand, talk about whether or not he believes a crime was committed a certain way based on bloodstain pattern analysis or certain trajectories. And to lay people, that sounds very scientific. It puts a scientific seal of approval on the conviction. And what we know today is that the error rates are enormous. So we have to pay attention to that and actually challenge every witness that comes on the stand and keep an open mind so that we can prevent more wrongful convictions in the future. Well, it sounds like a fascinating series. Uh, looking forward to seeing it. Aida and Vanessa, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having us. Thank you. The Skelos retrial about to get started, and the judge has already made a major ruling. Our Dominic Carter, of course he was there. He's got the story for us.